Dr. Stacia, welcome to our podcast. How long have you been in Mauritius now? Well, it's been nearly 10 years now. Since you've been here, if there was one thing, I don't know how well you normally sleep at night, but if there was one thing that would keep you up at night as a doctor with the state of health of Mauritians, what would it be? Well, definitely diabetes. We have a beautiful country, but we need to know that a quarter of our population has diabetes. And actually, every second person is not diagnosed. So we have a massive burden on diabetes here in Mauritius. It is quite common in the islands, but it's really massive here in Mauritius. So what, what do you think is the main cause? Do you think that it's our diet or do you think it's our genetics or a mix of both? That's a very, very good question because there has been studies showing that if you take the same population of Mauritians mm -hmm. in the UK, they would have twice less diabetes than they would have here. So definitely there is lifestyle, because we do know that type 2 diabetes is mainly a lifestyle disease. Mm -hmm. And there is genetics, obviously, because we see that uh, there is a pattern even in families where there's a whole lot of type 2 diabetes and a lot of insulin resistance. We'll definitely talk about it later on, I'm sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> and yeah, so mainly genetics and definitely lifestyle and also the fact that we don't do enough sports in Mauritius. So let's break it down because there's a lot of information here. So starting with insulin resistance, so what is insulin resistance and how is that related to blood sugar? So if I have a good average of resting, I don't know if I'm using the, term, <laughs> the right technical term, resting blood sugar, does that mean I'm okay or do I ha also have to test my insulin resistance? Well, you do know that we speak of diabetes and then sometimes we speak of pre-diabetes, mm -hmm. but of label, I don't believe pre-diabetes really exists. <laughs> I think it's already diabetes. Right. Because who decided that you would be called diabetic as from 6.5% of HbA1c? HbA1c is actually the glycosylated hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. That means how much time your blood was in contact with sugar. And we determined that as from 6.5%, you would be diabetic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a number. We are not numbers. We're human beings. So if you were at 6.4, doesn't mean you're perfectly healthy. Now you are 6.5, you have a disease. Mm -hmm. So there's this gray zone, right. which we called pre-diabetes, just to make it less daunting and uh, less scary. So it's as from, all well, the American says, as from 5.7% to 6.4%, you are in this pre-diabetic range. And in France, we say it's between 6% and 6.4%. And actually, it's when we check. So it's, it varies per country. It's not a yeah, settled. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's a gray zone. Right, so we don't really right. know. And we do know when you have reached 6.5% of A1C, we, well, we, we can't say for sure, but we do know that half of your pancreas is not working anymore. So, but something happened before. And we do know that this period before, which, which we call pre diabetes, your pancreas was already decreasing in, in, right. in activity. And what is one of the first signs you can have is when your sugar level is normal, mm -hmm. but you have to produce more insulin to keep it normal. So we call it insulin resistance because you need more mm -hmm. insulin to keep it normal. And we do know that your fasting sugar level will remain perfectly fine till you reach a certain stage of diabetes. And that's why a third of the patients we do diagnose with diabetes already have a complication. So if we just break it down to yeah, we have diabetes, pre-diabetes, and the pre-pre-diabetes, in inverted commas, it would be this insulin resistant stage. So what I try to do with my patients when they come for like a general checkup, I try to test because a, a fourth of the population is diabetic. Without knowing it. Yeah, and well, mainly majority knows about it, but so we can think that nearly half of the population could be pre-pre-diabetic, so insulin resistant. So if you do like on 10 people, you, you might find five pre-diabetic pre patients. So that's, and that's where it's important to tackle it because that's where you can reverse it. We do but, know but that. Can you, can you not reverse it when, so I'm past the insulin resistance phase. I'm pre-diabetic according to kind of official figures. Does that mean it's too late for me? Not yet. And even if you're diabetic, now recent studies show that have been published also during the EASD, which is the European Association for Study of Diabetes, mm -hmm. which was held in Stockholm in 2022. Okay. And they said if you lose 15 kgs, whatever your first weight was, you have 85% chances of reversing diabetes or being in diabetic remission. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't mean that you're cured, but you are in remission. So if you do it a bit earlier, so if you are pre-diabetic, it's even easier. And if you do it in insulin resistant stage, it's even easier. You might be actually cured of that state. So, okay, so let's assume someone is managed to put himself in remission. So he was pre-diabetic or even diabetic. Does, does that mean he's, well, I won't use the word doomed because I, I don't think that's the correct word, but does that mean he forever has to watch his diet? He can't eat cake, he, can't, he, he will have to be careful all his life, which is why we call it remission as opposed to it's not cured. That's a better. very, very good question. <laughs> we do know that there is no such thing as a diabetic diet or a non-diabetic diet. There is either you eat healthily or you don't. So many of my patients come to see me and say, well, now I'm diabetic, so now I have to stop, stop, stop. No, 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 no. It's just now you have, you are doomed mm -hmm. to live a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. And we know now that some of diabetic patients, type 2 diabetes, have a longer life expectancy than non-diagnosed diabetic because yeah. they do their checkups very often. Mm -hmm. They check their diet, they do sports. And when they are controlled, they can have a perfectly normal lifestyle. And obviously, if you have a normal lifestyle, you also have cheat meals. So you sometimes go and have cake, have some sweet drinks, or even can have enjoy a drink of, of alcohol. That's not a problem. But it should be, your basics should be healthy. Do you find it frustrating? I mean, I don't know whether you encounter those patients, but I often encounter people around me who are diabetic, and they see it as a sentence. And they don't improve their diet. So they say, as long as I take my meds, I can eat whatever I want. Oh, Do you man. encounter this type of Every day, every day. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I sometimes a bit harsh with some patients because I, I always tell them, you know, people in dialysis, they were taking their meds too. Eh? And even people in the grave, they, they used to use medicine. So medicine is, I would say, 10% of resolving the problem. 80% is your lifestyle and your diet and the last 10% is how you manage the stress, how is your, how is your sleep pattern, how is the, the whole rest. Something I, I always say on, on radio because I have the chance to, to do some radio shows. And I always say, you know, it's even saying that they actually took from me. <laughs> I always say, you see your doctor three times a year, but you see your plate three times a day. So treat your plate. That's much more interesting because medicine just makes a very small part of it. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a restrictive diet. I have even have patients that I sent to the dietitian or nutritionist and has told me, well, I can eat a lot. Well, yes, you can, but you just need to expense more than you eat. So if you have like you work out every day or every second day, you can eat a lot and that's not a problem. So what do you have to say about those? Because everyone are experts in everything these days uh, and I listen to a lot of noise online. And some people would, would, would say that actually, yes, exercise is important, but it doesn't really matter how much you exercise. If you eat a lot of sugar, processed sugar, then that's not good. <laughs> I will tell you something about this, not medical. Huh? <laughs> okay. It's actually my coach in, because I try to work out, I'm doing some sports and my coach told me very easy. You can't outwork a shitty diet. Yes, I, <laughs> I hope it's agree. for yeah. Yeah. adults. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, I swear all the time on this no podcast. It's <laughs> so if your, your diet's bad, you can work out as much as you want. It will still be a problem. So you, you have to have a, a healthy diet. And also, and I think that's related to, I've, I've re read some book recently. I don't know whether you, you've heard of it. It's this from the same guy who wrote the 5-2 diet. So he wrote a book, I think, called 800 Calories or something like that, with a view to reverse, you know, diabetes. So then he makes the distinction when you're eating whole foods, not, not processed sugar, about having a low GI diet as opposed to a high GI diet. Do you think someone who's sort of eating healthy should avoid, and, and, and who's predisposed to diabetes because it runs the family, etc., should avoid high GI food? Or actually you think it's, this is getting it's splitting hairs? Well, not really. It is, it is interesting. But we need to just understand what means high GI, low GI. Sure. When, when we talk about GI, it's what we call glycemic index. Mm -hmm. If you eat something that will be 100% transformed into sugar in your body, it means a GI of 100. That's high GI. Okay. I make it very easy. And if you eat something that only 30% will make your sugar level raise, then it's a low GI. 
and the cutoff is 50, 52. So low GI, for example, is what we call carbs, mm -hmm. like brown rice, pasta, uh, it's mainly a low GI. High GI would be a fizzy drink, like a sweet fizzy drink, uh, that's very high GI. Fruits are high GI sometimes, so there's right. very little fruits that are low GI, many it's high GI. But you have also to differentiate between GI, glycemic index, mm -hmm. and glycemic load. Right. So that's how much, because if you eat like half a banana, it's okay. That's your sugar load. Mm -hmm. Your GI may be high, but your load is low. If you eat 2 kgs of brown rice, that's still a lot. <laughs> that's low GI, but the load is high. So I would definitely focus on both. You can't have like only low GI food and missing on the sugar load, on, the, um, on how much you eat a day. So definitely both are very important. So if you only go on high GI, mm -hmm. that will make your insulin spike a lot. So you eat, your sugar level goes very high, so your body needs to produce insulin to bring it down. So you will put a huge burden on your pancreas to produce a lot of insulin. It's like when your boss comes in the morning mm -hmm. and says, well, you have all this work to do, but now it's a load. But if he tells you, well, you have all this work to do, mm -hmm. but you have till the end of the week. So it's easier. So you will have a less of a load or less of a, of a stress on your shoulders. So that's the difference with high GI and low GI. But imagine he comes with a box of all this, the stuff you have to do. And even though you have time for it, to do it, but you still load. So then that's also the sugar load. So definitely, if you have a high GI, that's more say of a stress for your pancreas and the sugar load is also a stress so i would go on a balanced diet and i would definitely favorize low gi sugars but pick high gi sugars that are known to be less toxic because you know there is sugar and sugar when you take like for example glucose that's the sugar that your body can actually recognize and use but in fruits you have fructose yes. which is let's say sugar and fibers, so that would is actually a less bad sugar. It's still sugar. We don't we, we can't say it's a good sugar. But it's it's a sugar. Getting into the science of it, but does the body convert the fructose into glucose, glucose yeah. and you know the fiber? Obviously. Exactly. Okay. So let's say, make it very simple. When when you eat like a good sugar, like for example fructose, mm -hmm. you will have glucose plus a side product that will be less toxic. If you take, for example, saccharose that you have in fizzy drinks, it will be glucose plus a toxic, an oxidant, and that will make you even more sick. That's why it's better to eat sugar from the fruits than from fizzy drinks. But again, it's sugar. So if you are diabetic and you should be, let's say, on 200 grams of, let's say, carbs or, or, or sugars in a day, I would definitely choose the less bad one than the really bad ones, which would be saccharose and all these, these products. Do you think it would be like trying to cheat the system if I have something with the high GI or I'm getting the spike and I go to a spinning class immediately after? Does it cancel that? Well, actually, <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, and we actually tell patients to eat high GI food before doing like a workout. Before, not after? Or it doesn't really matter? It doesn't really matter because if you're type 2 diabetic, if you're type 1 diabetic, that's a whole lot of science because the, when you have like a very high intensity sport and you're type 1 diabetic, your sugar will spike, but I you see. don't produce insulin, but it will spike, but then will crush after 30 minutes will crush. So you shouldn't inject insulin when you're on a high because then you will crush too, too low and you will be in hypoglycemic. So when you have a very high intensity, your, your sugar level raises. When you have a low intensity, your sugar will decrease slowly. And then if you are, let's say, nearly to a hypoglycemia when you're type 1, then you have to eat while you work out. For, let's say, type 2 diabetic or non-diabetic pa yeah. patients, then you can eat before, so you have some sugar to work out. Mm -hmm. Some patients prefer to work out without anything on the stomach, fasting. I'm fine with that too, unless they do a hypoglycemia after. But we definitely say we, you should eat after if you haven't eaten before. And I would also put like emphasis on the proteins you, you can intake. I will definitely suggest that you intake some proteins to rebuild the muscle that you have destroyed during your workout. So if it's like say like like heavy muscles or heavy loads on your muscles, mm -hmm. then you have a, you need a lot of proteins. 
that was supposed to be after but I'll ask the question now but is there a magic window because you read that if you don't take your protein within two hours of working out then it kind of you lose the benefit of rebuilding or do you think that's just again we're not machines huh? we're okay. humans so sure, <laughs> some sure. you can even say see some patients they eat a lot and then they'll gain weight everybody hates them <laughs> but some patients they can eat a little bit and they will gain weight we can't put like one size fits all Definitely, we, we know that metabolically, when you work out, the 30 minutes after you work out, that's where your protein reabsorption is the highest. But it just means the highest. It doesn't mean that you, you had zero after. Uh, it will still be fine, even if you take it hours after. But if you want to maximize the effect, then it's really in the two-hour window after you work out. Okay, so just to close the, the loop on the kind of uh, diabetes discussion, when I speak to my colleagues and friends and family, it dawns on me that very few people do regular blood work. How important do you think that is? And, and as from what age do you think we should start thinking about doing regular blood work? Let me just give you a saying of a Roman emperor. He said, keep your friends close to you keep your enemies even closer. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to know what's happening in your body. If you don't know, and you know, we even have a saying in uh, one of the associations I work with in, in Mauritius about diabetes. We say, in what I don't know lies dialysis. What, in what I don't know lies amputation, because diabetes leads to amputation. Sure. We have in Mauritius 500 people being amputated every year because of diabetes, and that could be prevented. All preventable, And, yes. and an amputation, your life definitely changes, changes. It's, yeah. it's, and not in a good way. Yes. So definitely you, you should do blood tests regularly. If you have, let's say, in the family, people having diabetes, and as from, I would, because nowadays I see patients with type 2 diabetes at 18. I even, 18 years old, I are they have, overweight normally, generally? They or are really? overweight, yeah. Okay. I even have, like recently I had a, a young girl of eight, she, she's, I don't want to give too much details because I definitely don't want you to, to make her recognize, but she's eight, well, nine now, and she was 78 kgs. That's my weight. Yeah. And I asked the parents, said, but how come? Must be a metabolic problem. I said, well, she doesn't like vegetables. And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, in, in, at my home, we eat what I say, not what exactly. they want. Kids, exactly. they don't know what is yeah. good for them. Well. If, if I say you need to eat that, it's because I did the study, and I think that's good for you. Eat it. But she likes all this junk food. I wouldn't even call it junk food. I would just call it junk because it's not really food. And so she did gain weight, and she became type 2 diabetes. But at 8, there's not much of a treatment. You know, even the, the metformin is allowed as from 10. So you just weight loss. Is it what do you recommend then? Well, what I said, I shocked a bit the parents because I said, well, you're, you're bringing your child to the grave. So if you do something now, so I, I told her, all the parents to put her on a diet, which was, was just healthy eating. Mm -hmm. And three months after, she came to my office running and so happy because she had lost 12 kgs. So and I she did, must have seen herself yeah. change her body shape she and was less full tired. of energy. Yeah. She was sleeping better and she gave me her blood works. And the, the A1C did decrease of 0 0.7, which put her in a pre-diabetic state which I'm still not happy about yes. because I want her to be at 5 or 5.2. And so she continues the diet and more than a year after she was diabetes free. I was really happy for her, but she had to do a lot of exercise, a lot of work and be very cautious about the diet. And now she's fine. So we can't say there's a best age to do blood works, but if you know that in your family there is diabetes, definitely have a check every year. It's, it's just a blood test. If you are above 18, you can do it every year. It's just a blood test. You check your A1C, you check your fasting blood sugar. Mm -hmm. It's already a good, a good hint. If, if you want to go a bit further, you can do your HOMA test, and the HOMA test is easy. It's just your fasting sugar level right. that you multiply by the insulin level, fasting insulin, and you divide it by 22.5. And if the result is more than 2.44, you're insulin resistant. So you already know. You don't even need to wait till become I diabetic. See. Okay. Yeah. Already know. And then you have to do your blood works every year or every six months according to your doctor. The other thing I often hear Mauritians talk about, I have high cholesterol. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> so I've always been mystified by the very term because I remember when I was growing up, 
I mean, things change all the time. As you know, when I was growing up, people used to say cholesterol is bad. You can't eat eggs more than once a week. I love eggs. I could eat eggs every day if I could. So maybe if you could demystify what is cholesterol, is there such a thing as good and bad cholesterol? How is it related to heart health? Sorry, I know there's five questions in there. And also, is it cholesterol that's bad or is it the inflammation that is caused by cholesterol that is bad? <laughs> that's a very tricky question. <laughs> you say things changing a lot. I, I think... The, the science is progressing. So that's why we don't change our mind. The science makes us change our mind. And you know how the science progress? By refuting or saying it was wrong what we did before. I know Einstein said the definition of stupidity is to do the same thing over and over. And expecting a different result. Exactly. Yeah. So if, if we do something over and over, it's not working, let's change it. So we do know when you have someone that's dying from a heart attack, you do an autopsy, you cut into the coronary artery, and it's full of cholesterol. So we, stupid human beings, thought, well, the cholesterol is the problem. Let's remove the cholesterol. And we remove the cholesterol to everyone. So we saw, actually, that the heart attacks would decrease. But not for everyone. And that was the problem, because then we had people having low cholesterol and having heart attacks. And we had people with high cholesterol and having no heart attack. And again, we had to do some research more. So now, where are we at now? We know that it's not because there are ashes that it, there is fire. It's because there is fire that there are ashes. So actually, the cholesterol tries to repair the inner part of the artery or the coronary artery. Okay. Or actually, every artery. So when you have a lesion into, in the endothelium of the, the artery, your cholesterol will have to come out of your bloodstream and try to it. fix it. Mm. So when it fix it, obviously your artery will become smaller, the caliber of the artery will become smaller. And then it will cause that, it will cause turbulences. So there will be more, let's say, stress on that part of the artery. So it will again do a cut or a lesion. Then cholesterol comes again and will repair it. And then, then the caliber is even smaller and more and more, your artery is completely blocked. I see. So what we try to do is remove the cholesterol. But it would be much more intelligent to, let's say, avoid the lesion of the artery. What's causing that? Ah, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> so what is causing endothelial stress is some, or what could prevent endothelial stress, it's something that many patients don't want to do. Let's have a healthy diet, doing sports, sleeping well. You see, everything that can stress your body will stress your arteries. Lack of sleep, eating toxins, being into the pollution, being stressed, sleep deprivedness, everything will cause a lesion. So obviously, your cholesterol will try to repair it. So obviously, I will have to prescribe your statins, which I'm not very fond of because it's because I don't have the choice that I prescribe medicine. You know, doctors don't prescribe medicine because they love medicine. It's because they don't have the choice. You know, in medicine, we don't do logical conclusions. We don't decide between good and bad. We decide between bad and bad, which is a moral choice. Mm. So what is worse for you? Being on a statin that would cause perhaps... A, or have a, a heart attack. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, once I had a patient coming to me and said, well, doctor, you prescribed me the statins. So you do know it will give me cancer in, in, in the future. And I said, I really hope you will have your cancer. Because if I don't prescribe you your statins, you will be dead in five years. But if you take it, you'll be, maybe you will live long enough to have your cancer. So let's hope you have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Listening, <laughs> I'm so no, sorry. But, yeah, but it's between, like you say, the lesser of two evils. Exactly. Yeah. So is there something as a good cholesterol and a bad cholesterol? Yes and no. There, there is what we call the high-density lipoproteins, which is called the HDL on your lipid profile. That's the cholesterol that helps to remove the cholesterol from your arteries and bring it back to the liver. So that's when you already had the problem. Now the HDL comes and tries to make it clean. You see, when you have to rebuild the wall, you will have to pierce into the wall so there will be dust on the ground and the AGL is the one, the cleaner that comes and removes that dust. So that's what we call the good cholesterol, which is not only a good cholesterol. It's, you also have to be cautious about that one. Really? And there is obviously the bad cholesterol. It's called the low density lipoprotein, the LDL. And there's the very low density lipoprotein, which is called the VLDL. And there's another cholesterol, which is more linked to your sugar metabolism which are the triglycerides. Well, I make it always very easy. Sorry for the doctors that are listening, might not be 
hundred percent <laughs> correct. But when there's too much sugar in the in the body, the body can't absorb all the sugar, so it can't have a storage of infant sugar. So, but we do have a storage of infinite fat. We just take three sugars and put it into one cholesterol, and we call it triglycerides. I see. Yeah, I see. So it's not agree. it's not particularly it's it's another form of cholesterol. It is a cholesterol. Right. And the lower it is, the better it is, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. But with HDL, it's the only one that we expect to have a higher level obviously not too high, but slightly higher levels. And the only way of increasing HDL mainly mm -hmm. is doing sports. Not eating healthy fats? Not only. Right. Sports is the one. So if you eat healthily and you have sports, your cholesterol will be definitely at its best. If genetically you don't have a predisposition of very having very high cholesterol, then very often you can avoid the statins. So if you adopt a healthy lifestyle and doing sports, often enough, you might avoid statins. But if you still do a heart attack, whatever your cholesterol level was, yeah. it's still too high for you. That means your stress level of the arteries is so high that even the slightest bit of cholesterol is too high. And that's why we had patients having low cholesterol doing heart attacks, because they had a huge endothelial stress. We'll get to stress in a minute, but just to close up that, that loop on the cholesterol. So as you probably know, so my latest blood work has showed high-ish HDL and kind of, I mean, it's, I think it said borderline LDL. It wasn't obviously ridiculously high, but th does that have to do with my genetic predisposition maybe or my level of stress? Because I do a lot of sports, so. Well, that's why your HDL was high, because you do sports. If, oh, I see, yeah. okay. And right. if, okay. if, let's say we always calculate a risk of patient having a heart attack or having what we call a major cardiovascular event. If you are very low at risk, we accept that your LDL might be a little higher. But if you are, let's say, you know that we always try to caricature things. So if you were, let's say, an Asian man, obese, smoking, mm -hmm. above 50, mm -hmm. well, uh, even if your cholesterol is low, I will put you on statins. Because you are more than at high risk of having a, a major cardiovascular event. It's like a patient coming to me and say, well, I always drive at 200 kilometers per hour on the highway. Well, obviously uh, you will need your seat, but, but you always need, also need a helmet and maybe very good airbags because that's, yeah. you're going straight to the, to the accident. Yeah. But if you're young, you're thin, you're doing sports and you manage your stress very well, you sleep well, mm -hmm. and you don't have high blood pressure and you don't have anyone in your family that, had, that was predisposed to having a cardiovascular event, we accept that your, your risk is quite low. Can I eat eggs every day then? Is that okay? <laughs> I wouldn't say every day because that would be very frustrating after a while. <laughs> but you can have eggs, obviously, because okay. even some studies, show, not all of them, but some studies show that actually eggs don't really increase your cholesterol. Really? Yeah, because they're not that bad. But it's in nutrition, eggs, you just bring some proteins. You don't bring a lot of vitamins. You don't, it's, it's, it's quite a poor meal so it I would see just so bring it's not actually, actually from like two eggs you're not actually getting that much protein well actually per egg you have between six and eight grams of proteins so it's 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 not it's interesting but it's not the fruit that will okay you'd get far more i guess people think of eggs because you know you don't see yourself eating chicken for breakfast i guess it, you're more likely well, to depends. eat <laughs> do you eat chicken no. for... <laughs> <laughs> but i i do use some protein shakes you know, there's even like these vegan proteins now made of pea. They're, they're pretty good. So, well, yeah. the taste is not the best, but if I can give you a secret, I use oats. So I take 30 grams of oats, right. even though my nutritionist told me I have to eat a bit more because I do work out in the morning. Yeah. But I take 30 because I don't like to eat a lot of in the morning. Yeah. And I put one scoop of protein in my oats. So you do like a porridge with yeah. your pr protein yeah. powder. Yeah. Ah, okay. It's, it's not. That. It doesn't look amazing. Yeah. The taste is not amazing. Yeah, unless you <laughs> had lots of honey in it or something. It does the job, but no, no honey. Oh really? No, no, just no. like not even some blueberries sprinkled on no, it. You know, in Mauritius like... they call me the sugar terrorist, <laughs> so I don't put any sugar. <laughs> you probably won't want to answer that, but do you drink Coca-Cola, for example? Uh, sorry, we're going back to diabetes now. Yeah. But um, sorry. Do, do you drink? Do you? Consume processed sugar. I, I do, I do, but not. I try to as less often as as possible. But to answer specifically, do I drink that type of drink? Not really. I have other drinks, fizzy drinks, and sometimes I take the diet version of it. But it's not a good idea. 
Some people would say that's really no, bad. It's, it's <laughs> as bad. But we do know it doesn't raise up your, your sugar level. But it's not a good stuff. It's not a healthy stuff. Yes. Sorry, I'm getting back to the previous, but I forgot to ask an earlier question. What do you think of artificial sweeteners? Do you, do you think they're as bad as people say they are? I mean, you've got, it's one of those things that I, I think is extremely controversial. You'd have some people that say it's really bad and others say there's nothing wrong with them because they... You, you know, I, I love sayings. I think I've told you already a few. I, I love what, what Paracelsus said. He was a German doctor in the 15th century. Okay. And he said, everything is a poison. It just depends on the dose. Wow. If I inject you 10 liters of water, you'll die. If I inject you a very small amount of cyanide acid, you'll die. So obviously, those sweetness are toxic, but depends on the dose. So if you have like one diet Coke every month, it won't do anything. But if you have like five a day, it will be toxic. And we do know that some of them are neurotoxic and they can kill your nerves. Mm -hmm. It depends on the dose. And it depends on how also you keep them. If you keep them in a very hot environment and they have to travel from Europe through Africa in a container where they can even go up to 70 degrees, it can be catastrophic. So it's a toxic, we do know, but it depends on the dose. Now, what is the, the, the toxic dose? We don't really know. And not everyone is the same to responding to that, that toxic. So some patient will be fine with it and some will immediately respond to it. So I would definitely go less, take it easy. Less is better. Yeah. Yeah. Water yeah. is the best. You spoke about stress earlier and the relationship with, you know, heart attacks and cardiovascular events. And I often think of stress as a as a silent killer. I know that I've come to see you a few times before and the first thing you've asked me is whether I'm stressed. How does how can someone tell if they're stressed? It, it's very complicated. Eh? I know. When I ask the question, I sometimes I ask myself, how would I react if my doctor... Well, I don't have a doctor, so that's a bad thing. But if I was the patient, how would I answer? Am I stressed? Sometimes it, it's stressing in itself. The doctor no. asking you that <laughs> <I know>. makes <laughs> you stressed. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. But, <laughs> but some patient will be immediately tell me, yes, I'm, I'm stressed. Mm -hmm. And some patient will tell me, well, I'm not stressed. But there are some tests we can do to see if the patient is stressed. A very easy one is when you go to bed, do you sleep well or do you fall immediately asleep or are you thinking or are you being like anxious about something before going to bed? Or when you wake up, do you wake up like in a shock and with a panic attack? That's easy. And also, how is their lifestyle? You know, you can ask yourself, am I happy? Am I happy to wake up and go to work? Again, a saying, a Chinese philosopher said, I think it was Confucius, he said, choose a work you love and you will never work a day of your life. Yes, I, I love my job. Before. So when I wake up on a Monday morning, I don't say, oh, five days till Friday. So now I'm happy because I will see patients. I love seeing patients. So I, I don't have the feeling I have, I'm working a lot, even if everyone around me tells me I'm working a lot. No, but for me, it's fine. But there are some works I don't like and those stresses me. So obviously, even if it's a little bit of time, it will stress me out. Let's say for the tax declaration. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That's not my yeah. job. I really don't like it. So it, it's stressing me out to do it. And so I, I am in a state where I know I am stressed. So if, let's say, more than 50% of my day is in the state I don't like, I am a stressed person. And so you can do the test for yourself. Am I stressed? Do I like my life? Do I, when I wake up, am I happy to do my, my to have my life, to, to do the work I do? then yeah, you're, not, you're not stressed. But if always you think about, oh, Monday, I have to go to work, then you live a stressful life. Because I, I think some people, or most people maybe, are not particularly self-aware. So they might be stressed without knowing it. And they might not even, they might need the help of a counsellor. They might not even know the answer to that question that you just said. Are there some objective tests that they could do, like blood pressure, things like that? Well... You know, some people that are not stressed have high blood pressure and some very stressed people have low blood pressure. So I it's, 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 so not, it's very not really accurate. right. It, it okay. can because okay. obviously for many people when they're stressed, the blood pressure goes up because when you're stressed, you produce stress hormones. That's the cortisol, adrenaline and all these hormones that will raise. But you can also raise them by doing skydiving, but you're not stressed. Well, it's a different kind of stress. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I, I, I do a sports that's quite dangerous, I do pole vault. So obviously when I have my pole in my hand and I have to jump, I'm stressed, but it's like a positive stress. So those tests can be done, mm -hmm. but they are not 
always very accurate. But what's very interesting is also to ask people around you. If, if you were always like a joyful person, like a person that had a very particular lifestyle, and they say, wow, you've changed. You're not as happy as before. You, you are more irritable. You know, when you are stressed, your brain will work at its minimum of efficiency. What we call the, you know, when you have low battery on your mobile phone, it will actually close all the apps. And then, so just to prevent for, yeah. for it to, to conserve to, the energy. Exactly. Yeah. So your, your brain, when it's at a conservative state, it will actually be only on two levels that will be fear and anger. So if you have a lot of anxiety, a lot of fears and everything, uh, every information that comes is like a mountain, that's fear. Because those two feelings, fear and anger, are the only ones we need to survive in a hostile environment. So imagine you are, let's say, in, in an environment and you haven't eaten for three weeks and there's a lion popping up uh, in front of you, you will still be able to run because you will be fearing. But now if you're in an environment and you haven't eaten and you're dying of hunger, then, and there pops up a dog, even if you're a dog lover, you will still kill it and eat it because you have to survive. And the human being has to survive. And that's anger. So if you're very irritable, if someone tells you a joke and you're immediately on, on defensive state, then you know that you're on this state. And if you are a long time on this state, you will develop one common feeling, which is sadness. And that and, could lead to depression, etc. And exactly. And that sadness will lead to dark thoughts and even suicidal thoughts. I, I need to say that suicidal thoughts are in a normal brain. They're already pre-encoded because those thoughts, they, everyone has them. Everyone has them. If you are long enough in a depression, you will have suicidal thoughts. If you are, whatever religion you are, whatever community you are, whatever nationality you are, those thoughts are in the human brain. So if you suffer long enough, you will develop them. And that's why if you see that your energy level in your brain, you are more into fear, anger, and so on, then you know that you are stressed. Those are not obviously objective tests you can do. There are some tests you can do. There is even research doing on serotonin levels, but it's still not very accurate. There are even like what we call functional MRIs, where we see which part of the brain will light up. There's something you can't do like in daily practice. But those tests will obviously be more and more accurate and more and more available to do those MRIs. You know, they, they did an MRI on gambling addict patients. Yes. They had certain parts of the brain that will actually light up and other ones, not at all. All those linked to dopamine and so on, they wouldn't even light up. So they needed to gamble to light up a little bit of dopamine. To get that, yeah. Exactly. That and it feeling. wasn't even about winning or losing. It was just a, the, the fact of playing. <laughs> so, you know, the human brain is quite complicated. I'm not a neurologist at all. But we definitely know that we all face stress. And we are, have more and more machines that make us gain time. We have like a dishwasher. We have uh, now these automatic things that actually... Clean mow, your house. Yeah, yeah. clean the house, they <laughs> mow the, the grass. Yeah. But we have less and less time. Ask people around you. Do you have time? Say, ah, oh, I don't have time, sorry. Yeah. But come on. We even, even have when we, we, we can do our groceries on, online, we have no time. So there's a problem. Yeah. What, where did we go wrong? Yeah. And that's one of my questions I'm asking myself. Where did I lose it? Because I never have time. Because before, when we didn't have all these cell phones, all this, we still had time to just relax. And that's something very important we should give in our schedule a time where we can just be, let's say, being bored, doing nothing, just mm -hmm. think about anything or meditate yeah. or just dream. You know, we have I must lend you this book. I don't know whether I have it in the office. I don't know whether you've heard of it. It's called 4,000 Weeks. It's all about, so 4,000 weeks is the average human lifespan. It, it creates about 80 years. And it's, it's about this, now we have, we are obsessed with being efficient. And it rejoins what you just said about, you know, we've got all these mechanisms and, and machines helping us be more efficient. And yet, we are doing more things, not less. Yes, exactly. Whereas our ancestors would be working the fields and then they'd stop work when it starts getting dark and just chill and share stories around the fire and that kind exactly. of thing. And that, that, that's, that's a huge problem nowadays because if we go a bit further, we have the highest rates of mental illnesses that we have ever had. Depression, obviously we had two years of, of, of lockdown, COVID, pandemic. That was stressful for everyone. 
But for both sides, it wasn't just a stress for, for patients, it was also stressful for, for doctors because it's, it was a new disease. We didn't know much about it. So we, we did gain the information as soon as you would get it. Well, obviously we would have different sources of, of, of information, but it was a very difficult time. And we have a lot of people developing depression and more and more early, like diabetes, we have like kids having depression because even it's because of peer pressure, is it because of school pressure? But I don't think the human beings live a healthy lifestyle nowadays. I think we were talking a little bit about brain and, and depression. So maybe I'm biased, but I haven't come across many doctors like you in Mauritius that have this almost functional approach to medicine. So, you know, we treat the symptoms, but I don't think we, we necessarily always go down to the source of the issue or the cause of the issue. And we all know, I think there's scientific, you know, many scientific research papers now showing how powerful the brain can be and the link between the, the mind and the body. So going back to stress, would things like meditation, for example, help to bring down that level of stress? Well, many studies showed it. And they said, whatever the meditation you're using is beneficial, 30 minutes per day. And if you are Muslim and you do your five prayers a day and it lasts more than 30 minutes, it's good. If you're Christian and you pray, if you're Jew, you pray. If you're Hindu, you do your prayings. It's good. And if you're atheist, think about something, think about the universe, breath work, yeah. breath work whatever. But take this time to give your brain a break because it's very, very important. And, and all the neuroscience papers showing that meditation is very healthy. So, and we should meditate at least 30 minutes a day, which I don't think if you ask around you, are people doing it? No, because you wake up and when you wake up is normally an alarm clock waking you up. So your cortisol spikes, then you have to have a coffee, which is caffeine, which spikes the, the, again the cortisol. And then you have to go to work, so your cortisol level is very high, so you are stressed. And you're driving on the roads in Mauritius. <laughs> no, that, that's, just, that's why I start very early, so there's no one on the streets. <laughs> so, uh, no, that, that's it's stressful. Till you go to bed, you're stressed. So that's one objective uh, answer. Is, are people do, stressed? Do you, yes. do you meditate? Uh, or do some form of I, I do you time? try to take some time to, to pray in the morning. That's why I wake up very early, because I try to, to just have this quiet time because I'm woken up. No Before one the kids wake yeah, up, obviously, yeah. Because then it's, it's a rush. But it, it's very important. And even my, my stress level, or my, my I, I even think clearer after, because then you just put the ideas into perspective, put everything down. Obviously, I will have a stressful day, like everyone, but it, it definitely helps. What would you say to those people, and, and I think maybe that's something you learn like any other skill. Some people would say, oh, I can't possibly meditate because, you know, I've tried to and, you know, after literally 10 seconds, the monkey brain comes in. And so is it just a question of practice? It is very easy and uh, you need to find your meditative state yourself. Some people need like help, an exterior help, and then you have these apps that you can have on your phone will help you. And some people just need to be outside. Some people need to see something. You know, just, just by watching the stars, it's, it's, it's amazing when you just watch this, this, the sky with the stars and you immediately have your brain think about something that's much larger than you. It, it can put you immediately in a meditative state. So, but it's, 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 it's practice. Uh, you know, some kids take a year to learn to walk. Some kids take nine months, some it's 17 months. And if you take longer, then fine. But, you know, keep going and keep trying you know, because it, it will be so beneficial for your brain. And the more stress you have, the harder it will be. To, to actually switch off. Exactly. And that's why you need to find a time in the day where your serotonin level is fine and your melatonin state uh, is fine and you don't have too much of the stress hormones. So it can be very early in the morning or it can be just before going to bed. You know, just by reading a, a book with your kids before going to bed, put the kids, because if you read, he will see only the images in his brain. That's like nearly a meditative state. So he will just imagine this story that you're actually telling him. And that, that's why they sleep so well after. And even by reading yourself that you have the images in your brain, but you, you know, having a TV or whatever streaming program you have, it, it doesn't give you any benefits in, in, in the brain. You just have all these images and it's You're not actually winding down. No, at all. Yeah. But if you read a book, it can be the same story. 
but you will actually be relaxed by doing so. Let's talk about exercise, because but I want to link it to what we've just discussed. What if some people, you know, they will still argue with you, no, I've tried yoga, I've tried meditating, I can't, but I love exercise. It is some kind of stress though. So, but because I'm, I have to be so focused in that particular exercise that I'm doing, that it's, I wouldn't say it gets me in a meditative state, but it, does it actually, could it have the same benefits as meditation or no? Nearly, but it's, I think they're complementary. So if, if you can have a sport that gives you the benefits, it's fine, but uh, you're still missing. If you just meditate and don't do sports, you're still missing something because obviously meditating won't increase your cardio. <laughs> so, but if you do the cardio and your meditation, or you can do both at the same time. You know, some trail runners, they tell you when they run and after a while, they are so in so much pain, they have to have their brain thinking about something else and they put themselves in a meditative state, they don't even know it, or even in the auto-hypnotic state, which also exists, and they can continue running. And uh, so they have both at the same time. Uh, but obviously sports will definitely help because if you do a sport that's quite, I wouldn't say violent, but, but quite intense, you can't think about anything else. Yes, yeah. I can tell you when I do pole vault, I can't think about anything else that the pole that has to be in that hole and I have to yeah. be above the bar. Yes, otherwise it's, you could, you know, get to yeah, yourself really injured. Yeah, yeah, yeah it happens. <laughs> <laughs> even though if I'm concentrated. But that's why sometimes intense sports are more beneficial or put your, well, because it's in a more focused state. Yeah, yeah, because you don't have the choice. So, and even depending on the sports, some sports show a lot of benefits because it's with like an animal, like horse riding. Mm. For even for, for kids, they, they I had I had a kid that was going through anxiety, and uh, he started horse riding, and he, he put he could just talk to the horse, and that would definitely help him. So it was his sports, but also his therapy. You know, now we are even more We do equitherapy that definitely helps even for autistic kids, for patients that really struggle to talk to a psychologist. That's, that's perfect. But definitely sports will put you in a, in a state where you are not under so much stress, even though you will still have stress in your sports. But it's, let's say, positive stress, like the skydiving stress. It's, it was like, like an adrenaline rush, but it's like a positive one. We've started talking about exercise a bit, and I think it's since the pandemic, actually, where I've, I've started doing a bit more and I'm trying new things. I've <laughs> recently started a boxing class, which I'm loving, I have to say. I don't know how long that will last, but I've, we've, I've only had two classes, but I love it. Do you think that, you know, all the metabolic illnesses or diseases that society is in, encountering today, we spoke about heart health, we spoke about diabetes. Do you think exercise is the kind of this magic formula for, for uh, not curing, but mitigating? Well, be completely honest, no for everyone, but for some people, yes. It will be beneficial for everyone to have to do exercise, but not everyone has a metabolic disease because of a lack of exercise and not everyone having a metabolic disease will be cured by sports or by doing uh, physical exercise. Some metabolic diseases are just dysfunction of an organ yeah. and it happens. You know, uh, you know, life is not always fair. We can have a patient smoking and drinking all their life and never having uh, lung cancer and kids developing a cancer and they had a very healthy lifestyle. Some things just happen, you know, I had one of my teachers, I really, really appreciate his, his, what he said. He said, you know, science will always answer to the question, how did it happen? But no, it will, not why. But never why. And he said, you know, he was a Jew. He said, you know, for me as a Jew, my why is Yahweh, now choose your why. So, and that's why uh, we need to ha have a, a peace somewhere where even if things happen, we don't, let's say, torment ourselves. Why did it happen? It, mm -hmm just happened. Now, so I'm not the fatalist, no. But sometimes you just need to let go because I even recently had a patient, she died of, of pneumonia and, and uh, I was asking myself, why, why, yeah. why? Was she healthy? <laughs> well, she was a smoker, but she had just a pneumonia. So normally in pneumonia, you give antibiotics and normally it goes well, but it didn't. So. You know, in medicine, we try to play God, but we're not. <laughs> we just try. Uh, we just try our best to, to help people and try to understand what's happening. But sometimes we, we don't. I'm sure in the, in the future, we'll have diseases coming up 
uh, emerging viruses that we won't understand. And we have just to accept it, that science is just a progress and uh, medicine is just a progress. Would I suggest to everyone to do sports? Yes, because it's always beneficial. But would it help everyone to 100% of extent? No, no we need to be very humble about that one, that some patients will still be diabetic, some patients will still be obese. Many patients come to see me because they are obese and they say, doctor, I need to lose weight. But you need to be very focused on why do you want to lose weight? Is it because people shame you? Is it because you feel diminished because you're obese? Then it's not the right reason. To change, to please others, won't make you happy. Yeah. We'll just transfer the problem to another, to another level. Uh, so, And then they will fall back into the trap probably after. That's where people get into yo-yo dieting and exactly. all that because there will be frustration and so on. So, yeah, well, obesity, we didn't talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's another big thing. That's probably the second thing that keeps you up at night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I even call it diabetes because mm. obesity and diabetes are so linked. But so preventable as well. I mean, we, we spoke about the things, some things can't be prevented, but I think these things are yeah. so preventable. Yeah, the majority is preventable. But the problem is, you, you know, I think people suffer people want the doctor to make you lose weight. I always tell my patients, you know, I, I'm, I'm not doing aesthetic medicine. I, I don't care about aesthetics. You can be obese and beautiful, but when you're obese, you are sick. It, you can develop 229 diseases. That's a recent study showing it. And uh, so that's why I'm not telling you, you have to lose weight to become more beautiful. No, because you're beautiful as you are, but you need to be healthier. You know, all these, these patients saying, I'm overly obese, but I'm healthy. That's not true. There was even like a very famous YouTuber and uh, he is highly obese and he said, no, but I'm fine. No, you're not. No, you're not. Uh, you're and not. also, I think we live in a society where, you know, everything's so wo woke and you get cancelled for saying anything these days. And we do, sometimes we tend to glamorize. You know, I think, yes, body positivity is one thing, but doesn't give you the license to be unhealthy. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, some patients, they well definitely don't choose to be obese. And they can have a healthy lifestyle, they can do exercise and still obese because they have metabolic disorder, they can have hypothyroidism, they can have anything. Even genetic obesity does exist. So we're definitely not against body positivity and they should be feeling fine with themselves, but they shouldn't say that lie that obesity is healthy that's a lie it is not healthy you can be beautiful you can be fine in your head you can be happy and that's fine but don't say it's healthy so something else i wanted to touch on because i i don't know whether it's the diet of the modern society and how the world has evolved but everyone seems to have some sort of intolerance these days so for example i myself and i don't know whether it's, it's man-made as in i made it up but i always say i'm gluten intolerant I have some sort of intolerance to, to lactose and dairy, although I love cheese. So do you think that's a result of modern society or have we always been like that? Oh, I don't think so. I think that unfortunately our food chain has changed a lot. Very easy example. The animals are fed with antibiotics, are fed with whatsoever. Some say that even they would have like, like a gross hormone, so they become even fatter. I'm not into all this nutrition thing because not my specialty, but we definitely eat less healthy than we used to. And even our products are less healthy. Some studies show that even fruits have lost 20% of their vitamin. So the food we eat now are not the fruits that our parents used to eat, are definitely not the fruits that we used to eat like 1000 years ago. So, so even if it's the same food like a, banana, a potato? A or... potato, a banana, uh, an apple has lost more than 20%. Recently, since we are measuring the percentage of vitamin days in each fruit, we have lost 20%. Because of the, the soils are, are full of pesticides, are full of pollution. Mm -hmm. So And even the fish we eat, they are full of plastic. So we have polluted so much our environment that it's not healthy anymore. To go back on, on all these intolerances, we, I would explain it as some food are pro-inflammatory. They will induce inflammation. I would always compare them to these 
hydroalcoholic solutions that you put on your hands. You, everyone knows them now. So uh, before that, we would only use them in hospital, yes, but now exactly. it's in every home. Yeah. So when you put it on your skin, it will give you like a cold feeling because it's alcohol that evaporates and that gives you like this cold feeling on your hands. But now imagine you have a cut in your hands and you put that on, it will burn you. So it's exactly the same with this pro-inflammatory foods. When your gut is perfectly healthy and perfectly fine, you can eat those and you won't react to those. But if you have the slightest inflammation, it will make it much worse. So let's take, for example, the gluten and the lactose, because those are pointed out to be this intolerance. Obviously, the cows, if they are full of antibiotics, full of whatever they give them, yeah, the milk will be also having those. And we do know that we have billions and billions of bacteria in our gut. We even have more bacteria than we have cells. So imagine you are an alien and he's watching the human beings on Earth. If he takes a human being and puts it into a microscope, he would say we are bacteria because there are more bacteria than human cells. So imagine what you do when you take antibiotics. You are killing all these bacteria. The so good, the bad, everything. Good, yeah. bad, whatever. And what made me very scared is I spoke recently to one of my colleagues. He's a pediatric gastroenterologist in Paris. Mm -hmm. And he said he tested 20 probiotics. You know these probiotics yes. that everyone is eating. Yes. And he said, do you know how many of those 20 probiotics had exactly the amount of bacteria that was stated on the box and exactly the bacteria that were stated on the box? What do you think of those 20? None. Zero. Yeah. None. Mm. Uh, even the expensive ones. So I was saying, what, what, what did you find? And he said he even found fecal bacteria. In the probiotics In the probiotics. Capsules. And, and it was like, like well, how can that happen? He said, because it's not a medicine. It's a food supplement. So there's a far less regulation on it. And you can find anything. He said, it's more plastic than bacteria. And, in, and when you take those probiotics, the major um, of these bacteria are dead. So it's, he said, eat healthy, let your kids play, and not always wash their hands before eating, because that's how they get their probiotics. When we were kids, we used to play in the mud. Yes, all That's the, time. the best probiotic ever. <laughs> because obviously we don't tell the kids to eat the mud. Yes, <laughs> yeah, they healthy. would probably put their hands in their mouth yeah. and yeah. But always to be putting like yeah. uh, these gels on their hands, yeah. killing all the bacteria, that's not a good idea. Yeah. Because we need those bacteria. We, need, we have bacteria everywhere on the skin. You know, bacteria of the skin help the, the scarring of your skin. Bacteria in your mouth. If you have not a good bacteria in your mouth, you will have what we call a mouth ulcer, mm -hmm. or even in your tooth, you can have uh, abscess, yeah. an abscess because it's a disband of your bacteria. And so we should definitely put focus on our own bacteria and not always destroy them. So if you want to help them with the diet, obviously a high sugar diet will nourish a certain population of bacteria and a certain population of even fungus in your intestine. For example, candida or candida albicans, which can be nourished with rapid sugar. So if you take a lot of sugar, this candida will take all the place. And so you won't digest the food that should be digested by the other bacteria because you don't have them anymore or you don't have them enough. So if you don't have the bacteria that help you digest, you will become intolerant. That's why we are all intolerant somewhere, somehow. And you know, some patients tell me, can I do a test to see what am I intolerant to? Yes, we can. But do the test yourself. Eat. A thing that makes you like bloated and so you are ish intolerant to that. But it doesn't mean you will be always intolerant. If you balance your diet and you actually have all the, the right bacteria in your intestine and you digest everything, you become non-intolerant and then you become perfectly fine to that food. So that's why all these restrictive diets that say you can only eat that kind of food, it's a catastrophe. Because if you restrict the whole diet and you only end up eating like meat or only eating grains or only eating one food, you will select only those bacteria that will digest that stuff. I see. And you then become you become more, in, it's a vicious circle in a way. And it's horrible because then you end up eating only one food. And a, a mono food diet, it's a catastrophe. You will lack vitamins, you will lack calcium, you will lack whatever. So definitely have a balanced diet, you know. I think it was Descartes saying, you know, happiness lies in la médiété in French. It means to be balanced everywhere. 
that's, that's how you become happier and even your body will be happier. If your blood pressure is too high, it's bad. If your blood pressure is too low, it's bad. It has to be balanced. And the human body is a huge balance. And what we call homeostasis. So even your pH should be at 7.41 in your, in your whole body. So if you drink something that is alkaline or if you drink something that is acidic, your body will arrange itself to be still at the same pH. So that's why you should bring some alkaline, some acid, some sugar, some protein, some fat, because we need fat also to, to live. So you have to have this balanced diet and have these probiotics, these natural probiotics in your food. Is yogurt a pro probiotic? For example, that's right. one. Okay. It could be like, like kefir, it could be kombucha, it could be like mushrooms. When you eat mushrooms, you don't try to, to clean them until there's <laughs> absolutely yeah. nothing on them yeah. and even on potato if you keep a little bit of skin that that's fine you know potato is grown in, in in the ground so we try too much to take all the bacteria out of our, our life but we need the bacteria i drink a lot of kombucha because i love it even our kids love it surprisingly because it's got quite a sort of a, a bitter taste they, they love it but sometimes i feel that whether i ask myself whether stress could be related to gut issues do you think there's a relation between the two yeah, yeah i really really believe so because let's put it very easy when you stress you produce cortisol what does cortisol do in your body it increases your sugar level if you have higher sugar levels you actually increase those bacteria that feed on sugar and the candida so obviously it has to have an, an impact because we do know that even let's say diabetic patients that have high sugar levels their gut is far less rich than people having known diabetes. So we do know that if you do like, like a, a bioma of the gut, if you take patients that have depression, patients having chronic health issues, they have a very poor gut health. Gut health. And the, I read, I mean, I think maybe it's still very early days, but I read some articles, I don't know whether you've come across them, where there's been fecal transplants into, into guts of unhealthy taking the gut of healthy people into the gut of unhealthy people and even people who were on the autism spectrum their symptoms improved i found that fascinating well i did my studies in paris okay. and when i was in paris in 2004 that's nearly 20 years ago <laughs> my professors talked about it really so it's yeah. not actually that new it's not <laughs> we're new talking hour. about it now but well i've come across it now but, but it okay. were professor if i can even yeah. tell the name was professor Kuhn and right. professor gendre okay and they were huge specialists of gastroenterology in paris i was at saint antoine at, at that time and they would speak about that and they would they told us but i don't think patients are ready to, <laughs> and they're still not to have, <laughs> to have poo injected inside <laughs> yeah. of them yeah but it works wow. it definitely works they even tested it on Crohn's disease, on ulcerative colitis, mm -hmm. and it works. I wouldn't say it works in 100% of the, the cases, but it, it works for people having like food intolerances, even people with diabetes. It works. I'm not saying it's a miracle drug, sure. but we do know that's something we need to go and look for. And that's how medicine works. You know, we discovered insulin in 1921. Only? That's 100 years ago. That's yesterday. So we're discovering now about the microbioma and we're discovering now all these bacteria, good bacteria, less good bacteria. And now we have to research. But at the time, insulin was one hormone. Now we have billions of bacteria to check. So we definitely will go further into that, that field. But I'm, I'm sure that the future is quite exciting for, for medicine on, on that path. And also the link with the brain as well. I think there are you know, people saying, I can't remember what I, where I read that or heard that from, that the gut is the second brain or something like that. We, yeah. we actually have a whole load of, of, of neurons in our intestine, nearly as much as we have in the brain. And they work together. Yeah. So uh, you do know that... Which when is why sometimes that if you're nervous, you feel like butterflies or when exactly. you feel anxious, you feel it in your, in your gut or you have a gut feeling. <laughs> exactly. <call it. laughs> but and, and yeah. even on the study of, of diabetes, we go more and more into the gut because we know about, about GLP-1, mm -hmm. about uh, all these incretin drugs that are gut linked. It's really amazing. And even for obese people, they have a very poor microbiome. You know, when you're very stressed, you can't digest anything. So, uh, and you will see, and so th there's definitely a link, brain and intestine, that we ought to, to 
dig deeper. Just to conclude on, on that topic before we move on to the last one, if someone wants to improve their gut microbiome, would you just ask them to well, eat as balanced and varied diet as possible? Yes, yeah. exactly. And eat like this raw food. If, if you eat a, a banana, don't try to wash it for an hour. Just peel or the, the or, yeah, yeah. Just peel the, the skin off and eat it. Eat like even like these raw fruits that that without any skin. Uh, obviously, wash it a little bit, mm -hmm. but it will actually increase even your good bacteria. And even if you ingest slightly bad bacteria, the good bacteria will kill it themselves mm -hmm. because they are in numbers. Mm -hmm. And have a balanced diet. If you're vegetarian, then avoid meat. I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but eat as rich as possible. Yeah, they Not say that you know your plate should look like a rainbow. <laughs> exactly. Basically. Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't always do that, but I try to. <laughs> Last question. Well, la last topic, I want to say your last question, sleep. I, I love sleep. <laughs> but I also think that it's the, probably the most underrated factor to, I want to say longevity, but not necessarily longevity, to health, to health. Yeah, but I would turn the, the, the question a bit, why do we sleep so little? Why is our sleep so, so, so bad nowadays? I think definitely because all of the screens that we have during the whole day, because it, it will stimulate your brain the whole day. And everyone, well, let's say not everyone, but many people, they would sleep with their phone. Yes. Or, yes. I have to admit, I love to read and I read on my phone. <laughs> no, but surely you put it on airplane mode or something. Yeah, you yeah go to bed. definitely. Again, it would be better to read in a book yeah. on, a, on a piece of paper, but even patients just, just having like their phone like watching videos or, or whatever, yeah. it, it, it's not good for your brain because you stimulate the brain. There's too much of, of images you have and it will destroy your, your sleep. And if you eat too much, let's say, processed food that can increase your cortisol and so on, that, that will also make your sleep less, less good. And people go to bed more and more late. And we do know that the hours you sleep before midnight are more efficient than the hours you sleep after midnight. Because when you go out on a Saturday night or and you go to bed at three in the morning, even though you sleep till 10, you still have your seven hours the of sleep. The quality of sleep is not the same. And you will feel tired the next day. And if you go to bed earlier, and even though you, you might sleep a little bit less, but your quality is much better. So why is that? It's mainly linked to our biological clock, which we do all produce cortisol in the morning. I see. So when that actually our natural clock will kick with the, the cortisol. So if you go to sleep and your body is producing cortisol, your sleep will be horrible. And we do know that your melatonin production is much better when the sun goes down because your body will put itself into like a resting mode. So if you produce those hormones better, then you should listen to your body. And when you feel like going to sleep, go to sleep. Don't try to stimulate your brain by watching TV or even watching videos on, on, on the internet because then you would deprive your, your body of that, that very needed sleep. Is there a magic number? I know people love talk about eight, but also, as you said before, we're not robots. Everyone's different. I think my figure is eight, between seven and a half and eight. I, I think that's my magic number. Uh, yeah. I can tell you mine, <laughs> because we're more like six. Well, we do know. Because you wake up early, right? I wake Probably. up very early, yeah. but I go to bed early. But I don't sleep a lot, but my body feels Rest fine with it. So if you feel tired, means that you don't sleep enough or you don't sleep well, because we do know that, that many, many patients have sleep apneas. I think I will have to come back another day. I think so, because <laughs> I know you have to leave soon, but it, that's a topic of its own, yeah. right? It, and it's, is it linked to obesity? It is, but it yeah. can be with non-obese patients. It's something where, where the patient doesn't, wakes up every two or three minutes because of an apnea. I had one of my patients, he had 54 apneas per hour. That means nearly one every minute. So he's not sleeping at all. That's when you're not breathing, right? Yeah. He stops breathing <sighs> every minute. And so, so he wakes up, but his brain doesn't know. But his brain is active the whole night, and so he doesn't sleep. So there is one, one of the causes why, uh, obviously, nicotine is a, a brain stimulant, uh, and that's catastrophic for your sleep. That's catastrophic for everything. So you should never touch cigarettes. Alcohol makes you, you, makes you sleepy, but you sleep so much less good. So we should avoid also alcohol. I'm not saying you should avoid everything. <laughs> 
sometimes a good glass of red wine it is fine <laughs> i was i was going to ask you about alcohol as well because i i think i told you about this podcast that i watched recently and it put me off alcohol forever it basically said it's a poison it's kind of uh, because it's socially acceptable <laughs> we have it it's actually the drug that makes the most victims in the world but it's a legal drug, yes, <laughs> so exactly. we accept it. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's, that's, it's, it's complete nonsense. <laughs> do you drink alcohol? I do enjoy sometimes okay, uh, a glass. Of a glass. Wine or, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I definitely notice when I drink a glass of wine, I don't sleep well. Yeah. Uh, and even I wake up at, at midnight, yeah. like all of a sudden, even yeah. some can have goods or... I notice because I, I wear a Fitbit that your resting heart rate is higher and I can see, yeah. I can actually track it. And if I've started drinking or I just had a glass of wine much earlier in the evening, then it will start to go down earlier in the night. And yeah. And yeah. even it would change your body temperature. Because, you know, many patients think if they're cold, they would drink like a shot. It makes them feel warm. Yeah. They will feel warm, but they will be colder. That's why we have some homeless people in Europe. They die of hypothermia because they were drunk. Wow. They didn't feel they were cold, so they died. But so they were you, actually cold. Yeah, yeah, they were cold, but they didn't feel it. So it's a paradox. You feel warm, but you're not. To go back to, to the sleep we would definitely have to check what is the the magic number for ourselves. so we have to listen to our own body if i feel rested and fine ready for my day if after six hours of sleep fine six if you need seven then sleep seven you know i love what arnold schwarzenegger said once <laughs> he said you work out so much uh, a day and then you have to sleep six hours a night and one said oh, but i need eight hours and look the guy said sleep faster <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> love it. Yeah, okay. So. Okay, fair enough. So I think yeah, I've I've got a good good amount of sleep. So why is it good? I think I I think I know why it's good, but I think most people don't know why it's good. Why it's good to to sleep? Why it's in, because we tell I mean my kids always complain because I make them go to bed at 8 and they're always asking me, "Why do you go to bed later?" And I said, "Well, your body needs to grow and this is it's when you sleep that your body grows." That's the explanation that I give them. But would an adult say, well, I don't need to grow, I'm grown. <laughs> you know that when you are a kid, you produce your growth hormone mm. during the sleep. So the more you sleep, the bigger you'll be. And we actually don't really know, is it because you're genetically uh, predisposed to become very tall, like Shaquille O'Neal, yeah. that you sleep a lot? Or is it because you slept a lot that you oh. became so tall? So oh, that's, okay. that's, that's also a research that would be very interesting. Yeah. But we do know that growth hormone is produced during your sleep many hormones are produced during the sleep. For kids, obviously, all this anabolic state where they grow, they, um, they develop their, their brain, their uh, lungs, whatever organ, is very beneficial to sleep early and sleep enough. But it's not because we're adults that we don't do the same as kids. We still produce growth hormone. We still produce all these hormones, but we use them in a different way. We don't use them in, in growing, but we use them by fighting cancer cells. We use them by fighting, because you do know that we can develop cells that are abnormal and our, you, our body will recognize them as abnormal and kill them before they become cancerous. So that's something will definitely help the system by destroying or have this retro control on itself during the sleep. And we produce all the, the, the brain hormones that will help you even to, to develop like, like positive thinking, to fight depression and so on. You will need sleep. Uh, so definitely we don't grow, but we use all these hormones to develop and we develop every day. You know, all our organs are regenerated. You know that a heart regenerates itself in 50 years. So when you are 50, you have a different heart. A new heart? A complete new heart. So your liver regenerates far quicker. You, how, but how? <laughs> like what happens to the old heart? No, no, it doesn't change one from, <laughs> but all the cells, they regenerate. Oh, wow. So um, now I would definitely have to come back. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, because I have like 10 more questions just from that. <laughs> and the so, blood as well, like the blood, the blood I knew. We know yeah. that, because yeah. when you, even when you give like a blood sample or a blood donation, which are, we always encourage everyone to give blood, yeah. but your, your body will reproduce in new blood in 120 days. Hair are reproduced every day. Nails, even the skin is reproduced every four weeks, because when you have like a sunburn, Obviously, in Mauritius, it can happen. Uh, after four weeks, you have a complete new, new skin. skin. Yeah. But the problem is, when you have a new skin, this new skin might develop one 
part that is less good or has a mutation and can develop, let's into say, cancerous into cell. cancerous cells. So that's where we have to check the skin. But all the organs are regenerated and our major regeneration is made during the sleep. That's why, where we regenerate and even our brain regenerates. That's very important and that's something we never thought would be possible. But we do know that brain cells do regenerate far slower than the heart, far slower than any other organ, but they do. So now we need to find ways to accelerate the regeneration of the human body just for patients having like a stroke to regenerate these cells they have lost in their brain to reproduce them. We could speak about stem cells for overall. <laughs> Could I become cleverer by sleeping more? <laughs> well, I would give you a last in, saying. In but, theory. <laughs> but then I would quote my mum. Okay. She okay. would, because you know, I, I did study at the university for 14 years and sometimes I do stupid stuff. So okay. she would call me and say, well, you see, Damien, university made you more educated, but not more clever. <laughs> because you weren't sleeping probably. No, probably. <laughs> I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> So. Wonderful. Well, I think I'll end here because there's just so many things, more things, but thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, you for making the time. I think there's lots more to explore and I'm, I'm glad there are doctors like you in Mauritius. I personally don't know any other that, as I said, you have a functional approach to medicine. Yes, you will prescribe, as you said, you, you don't like to prescribe medicine, but you will because sometimes you have no other choice. But I think you also look into what is the root cause? You know, like for example, you know, I once came to see you and I was slightly anemic and you wouldn't just, okay, we'll do this instead. You try to get into the root cause of, well, well what could be causing that? And I think that's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I will gladly come again. <laughs> Lovely.